Our Father in heaven, Lord, we, we love you, Lord, and we thank you so much, Lord God, for your love for us. Lord, you are always working. And if we open our eyes, Lord God, we see you working everywhere. Lord, you show us so that we again can join you, Lord, so that we can be a part of what you're doing, wherever you're doing it. And I'm so grateful, Lord God, to know you. I'm so grateful, Lord God, that you have called me and saved me. And I know every one of us listening, Lord God, can echo those same words. Thank you, Jesus. We could be lost in the world again. We could be lost in our sins. But we're here because you love us. But we're here because you have called us out of darkness and brought us into the light, Lord God. Thank you for that, Lord. We honor you tonight. Be with us. Speak to us. As we open up your word, as always, Lord, open up our hearts and be glorified tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening once again. If you have a Bible, which I hope you do, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 7. Okay? Book of Isaiah chapter 7. Again, moving right along. Again, we've had several studies in the book of Isaiah. Uh, Each and every one of them, again, has been very, very important. If you missed any of them, all on YouTube, all on the church website. You can go back and catch yourself up. This is a very important book of the Bible. Now, as I always do, again, as I always begin, I always begin at the beginning. And I want you to remember, again, the theme of the book is the salvation of God. And I've titled it this because the name Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation. God is salvation. I'll say it this way. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, from the very beginning, again, of of human history, God has demonstrated his great love, hasn't he? From the very beginning, again, we can read story after story of God in his mercy, according to his grace, reaching out and desiring to save those that would turn from their sin and turn to him. And literally, we can quote story after story. We can cite chapter and verse of people who believed God, who turned to God, again, who turned from their sins and were, again, saved. But that's not everyone. One of the interesting things that we know is that each and every person has been given a free will. Isn't that right? God didn't make robots. He didn't. God desires that we choose him. True love, again, is a choice. It's not a command. It's a choice. And God desired that we choose him. And so he has given everyone a free will. A free will that we can decide for ourselves to choose God or not, to reject God or not. And again, we read story after story of those that chose God and were saved, but also story of many who rejected God. And because they rejected God, they faced the consequences of rebellion against the Lord. Now, this is truly demonstrated in the story of the northern kingdom of Israel. And we've talked a lot about the northern kingdom. Remember that after the death of Solomon, the uh, 12 tribes of Israel split in two. There was a division. 10 tribes went with Jeroboam in the north, and two tribes went with Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son. And they were the south. They became known as the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, when it came to the northern kingdom, as we've covered many times before, they never had one good king. Jeroboam was an ungodly man who created a false religion, and every other king after Jeroboam in the northern kingdom was bad. For centuries, they were against God. They were backslidden away from the Lord, which is why so many books of the Bible Old Testament, were dedicated to the prophets that God sent, both to the northern and southern kingdom, but specifically to the northern kingdom to warn them, turn back to God, turn away from your sin, otherwise you will be destroyed. Now, when most people think about God, they they refer to him as as a judge, as if he's this mean God with a big belt, right? Who just wants to punish, who's just waiting for people to mess up. But that's not the God of the Bible, because the God of the Bible is a good and merciful God who desires that all people would be saved, 
that all of us would come to repentance, that we would turn from our sin and turn to God so that God could bless us. The reason God judges is because he has to. How would you feel if you heard about a judge in any court that was letting all of the people who did everything wrong go free with never being punished? Would you consider him a good judge? Hopefully not. You would say a good judge would stand for what is right. A good judge would punish wrongdoing. And that's exactly why God does what he does. He must do it because he is a good and righteous God. Now, God had already declared that he was done with the northern kingdom. He had given them opportunity, opportunity, chance after chance to turn from their sin and repent. And finally, if you were with us again, in the book that we just finished, right? God told them, that's it. You're done. You guys are going to be destroyed. But when it came to the southern kingdom, remember, they were not as bad as their brothers in the north. Yes, they were compromising. Yes, they were following in their footsteps, but they were not as bad. And so this is what the book of Isaiah has been all about. God sends Isaiah to the southern kingdom of Judah to minister to them, to warn them to turn from their sin, to stop following in the footsteps of their brethren. Otherwise, they too would face a similar judgment like the one that was coming upon their brethren in the north. And this is exactly what we've been reading. Very quickly, remember, we read in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2, children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. Okay? We read that at the very beginning of chapter 1, as Isaiah, speaking before the Lord, declares to the people that God had created you, God had raised you, God had saved you, he's provided for you, he's protected you, and yet you turned from God. And then he said in Isaiah 1, 4, all sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring and evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they have forsaken the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel, they are utterly estranged. Isaiah declared again, that the people that had been called to be a holy people for God in their free will had chosen sin. They chose again to rebel against God. And literally over the first five chapters, if you've been with us, Isaiah called out the people on their sin, warning them again that if they did not repent, they would face a judgment that was coming. And then last week was very interesting. Last week was a little different. For those people that questioned who Isaiah thought he was to call them out on their sin, chapter 6, last week, was all about Isaiah taking us back. Taking us back and, and informing us, sharing with us the vision that God had given him. The vision, again, that called him, that showed God, I mean, that God showed him his holiness and showed him that he was a holy God who desired righteous people, a holy people who followed after him, which is what led Isaiah then, again, to call his people back to God, to call his people to get right with God, and to serve him. Now, as we pick it up in chapter 7, chapter 7, again, we now move away from chapter 6, and in chapter 7, God is going to send the prophet Isaiah somewhere. Very important. He is going to send him to speak directly to the king of Judah. It's a man by the name of King Ahaz, A-H-A-Z. Ahaz was backslidden from God. Ahaz was in sin. He literally was in rebellion against God. And because he was in rebellion against God, he found himself in a crisis. He found himself, again, fearing for his life, literally. All of this is happening because he was not right with God. And so God in his mercy, again, sends his man, his prophet, to speak to the king, to call him back to God, to call him to get right with God. If you're taking notes, again, you can write this down. Isaiah is sent to King Ahaz, okay? Write that down. Isaiah is sent to King Ahaz. This is what we're going to be looking at, okay? Overall, we're going to see 
Isaiah challenge the king to get right with God and to believe God's word. And I love this because this is so practical for everyone, okay? Everyone, in order to get right with God, we must first believe God's word. We must first go to God, right? First believing that he is. And this is exactly what is taking place. Isaiah is going to call the king, believe God, get right with God, come back to God. And it begins again in chapter 7 with the civil war taking place, okay? It's the first thing we see. We see a civil war taking place, amen, okay? I'll say it again. Isaiah's challenge of faith to King Ahaz, and it begins with the civil war. Let's pick it up here, verses 1, chapter 7. In the days of Ahaz, this is the king, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, okay? Isaiah begins and he sets the tone. He, he gives us the background. He informs us of the setting. Now, most of you were with us when we covered the introduction. For those that weren't, let me just take you back very quickly to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. The book began this way. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, the southern kingdom and its capital, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, who were the kings of Judah. Now, I shared with you in the introduction that the ministry of the prophet Isaiah lasted 58 years. What a long time that he was used by God, again, to minister to the southern kingdom. During these 58 years, four different kings were on the throne of Judah. We would call them a great-grandfather, a grandfather, a father, and a son. That's what these four names are. These are four different kings, all of which, again, were descendants of one another. Now, if you remember, and you might remember, Uzziah was a good king. He served God. Yes, he made choices, bad choices at the end, but overall, he was a godly man who served the Lord. His son, Jotham, was also a godly man. He was also a godly king. But then we came to his son named Ahaz. And sadly, Ahaz was a wicked king. Now I want to stop for a second and I want you to think about it. Every parent, whether you're a, a mother or a father, hopefully desires that their kids serve the Lord. Can someone say amen? This is my heart's desire, right? My kids and my grandkids. I want them to serve Jesus. Why? Because I want them to experience the blessings of God on earth, but I want them to, again, experience eternity with God in heaven. This is what I want. There's nothing more important, right? And hopefully, there's nothing more important to you. More important than them being doctors or lawyers or winning the lotto. I want to see them in heaven. And this is, again, so important. Godly posterity. But this is not what happened. Uzziah, the grandfather, was a godly man. Jotham, the father, was a godly man. But Isaiah, I'm sorry, but Ahaz was a wicked man. And we find this in 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Ramalia, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 26 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. Notice, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, as his father David, King David, had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Remember, the Kings of the northern kingdom of Israel were all wicked. They were all bad. And so what do we read here again? We read here in 2 Kings that despite the fact that Ahaz had a godly grandfather and a godly father, because each of us has their own free will, this man chose to turn his back on the God of his fathers. That's what happened. And how sad. But this happens. Again, this happens today. We see this even in our own lives as this man, again, chose to walk away from God. 
I have to believe he was raised in the things of God. He had a godly grandfather and a godly father. But that's no guarantee, right? Everyone has that choice to make for themselves. And that's what happened. He walked away from God, choosing to reject God and instead of serving God. Now, what I love about this is we serve a God who doesn't give up on us. Isn't that right? As parents, should we ever give up on our kids? Even if they don't want to serve the Lord, we don't give up, right? We keep praying. We keep believing God for them. We keep, again, uh, telling them about God, telling them about the plan God has for their life, right? We keep bringing them to church or inviting them to church. We do everything we can. They have to decide for themselves, but we do everything we can to impart, right, to influence them in the things of God. What I love about this is sometimes, and I'm speaking from experience, as many of you, again, are in that same boat. Sometimes we feel like, man, what's up with our kids? How come they're not, how come they don't want to serve God? Am I the only one who's gone through that? It happens. And it's discouraging. It's depressing, seriously, right? Right? But not just our kids. How many of us have family members or loved ones or best friends or whatever? People that we know and care about and we want to be with them in heaven. But today, they don't want anything to do with God. And you can pray for them and you can invite them. And again, it seems like it just goes in through one ear and out the other and it's discouraging. And we can become discouraged. But when we do, we need to remind ourselves that God is in control. Isn't that right? Seriously. That God is in control and that God has a plan. And I believe that. I believe it for my kids. I believe it for my grandkids. Again, I believe, I believe it's for everyone. God has a plan. We don't give up. We keep believing God. We keep trusting in God. And the awesome thing about God is that God is in control, isn't he? And God can do things. God can cause circumstances to take place. God can even create a crisis in the life of people that we know and love to get their attention. Now, one of the prayers that I have prayed, and, 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 and maybe some of you might disagree with me on this, but I have prayed, Lord, whatever it takes to bring them to you. That's been my prayer. Seriously. Seriously. Whatever, Lord. If it takes you putting them in jail, if it takes you putting them on their back in a hospital bed, if it takes you putting them in rehab, whatever it takes, God, to get their attention, do it. Why? Because the next life is more important than this one. And I really believe that, seriously. And I pray, and that is my prayer, right? Sometimes, again, my kids might say, Dad, don't pray that way, right? Hey, whatever it takes, I want you in heaven. I want you in heaven with me. And what I love about this is we serve a God who does that. He can cause circumstances. He can create a crisis in their life to get their attention, to wake them up, to bring them to understand they need him. Because we all need God. And sometimes we're blinded, right? We're blinded by money. We're blinded by success. We're blinded by whatever, thinking that we don't need God, when in all reality, we do need him. And so this is what God does. And I pray again, if you would be willing, that you would pray the same exact thing. Pray God, whatever it takes, God, for my parents, whatever it takes for my grandparents, whatever it takes for my kids or my grandkids or my best friends, you do it, God because they need you even when they don't understand it. Well, I bring all this up because guess what? God allows a crisis to take place in the life of King Ahaz. And he does it to get this backslidden king's attention. Keep reading again, verse one. Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, 
Syria is in league with Ephraim. Ephraim was the largest tribe of the northern kingdom. The heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of a forest shake before the wind. Let me show you a map again, very briefly, but this might help you. Remember, the people of Israel are divided. Ten tribes in the north in yellow, two tribes in the south in pink in the, in the southern kingdom of Judah. What is taking place here is that the people of Judah, currently being ruled by King Ahaz, receive word that the northern kingdom of Israel has formed an alliance with Aram, A-R-A-M. You guys see them on the top, top right? Aram is another name for Syria. And these two nations, the northern kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Syria have united. And they're now going to wage war against who? Against the southern kingdom of Judah. Now the question is, why is this happening? Why did these two tribes or two nations unite in the first place? Well, let me explain to you that it's during this time that a new world power was growing. They would become known as the Assyrian Empire. And we've talked about them many times before. Assyria would be further off to the right or to the east of the map. And they were a growing nation. And what was happening is they would continually conquer the smaller nations around them. And so they were gobbling up, right? Like Pac-Man, right? They're getting bigger and they're getting bigger and they're growing as they're conquering more of the smaller surrounding nations. So the nation of Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel decide, why don't we team up? Why don't we join together to fight against the Assyrian threat. They knew sooner or later Assyria was coming after them. And so they decide let's team up to defend ourselves. And that's what they did. They made an alliance, these two nations. But they didn't stop there. They then said, why don't we go and tell Judah to join us as well? And so that's what happened. They sent word to Judah, to King Ahaz, saying, join with us. And Ahaz said, no, we will not join with you. And so what happened? These two kings said, if you don't join us, we'll conquer you then. We will turn against you. And this is exactly what was taking place. These two nations had now come down to attack the nation of Judah. And when word got out to the people of Judah, which Isaiah calls, I want you to notice, the household of David, the descendants of King David. They were all, what does it say? I'll, I'll quote it right. Shaking as the trees of, a, of the forest shake before the wind. Did we get the picture? We would say what? They were shaking in their boots. That's what it means. They were fearful. A bigger army, two nations, were now on the attack, were now coming against them. And they were afraid. They were literally fearing for their lives. They found themselves in a crisis. But interesting. Isaiah, again, refers to them, and look back again in verse 2, as the house of David. And that's very, very important. Why? Well, I want to remind you again, and one of the most important chapters in all of the Old Testament is 2 Samuel chapter 7. We don't have time to get into it, but if you want to read it later, read 2 Samuel chapter 7. In that very famous chapter, King David wanted to build God a temple. You guys remember the story? He wanted to build the house of God. At the time, the Ark of the Covenant, where God's presence resided over, was in a tent. It was in a tabernacle. And David, because he loved God so much, wanted to build him the temple. David was a man of war. He was a man of blood. And so God told them, sorry, David, but you can't build me a house. But God was so blessed by David's heart and David's love for the Lord that God told David, number one, I'll let your son build me a house. And that's why Solomon built the temple known as Solomon's temple. 
But the other thing that was even more important than that is God told David this, very important, don't forget this. God told David, David, because you wanted to build me a house, I'm going to build you a house. And what God meant by that was I, is that God was going to build him a household, a legacy, a family, promising David that through him, that his descendants would reign upon the throne forever. And that's how we know, again, that the Messiah, Jesus, came through the line of David. He was a fulfillment of that promise that God made to King David. Again, very, very important. That's why when we read the Gospels, it start, it start off Matthew and Luke with the genealogy of Christ to show us that Jesus indeed came from the line of King David in fulfillment of these prophecies. Now, the reason this is important is God made a promise to David and his descendants that they would last, that someone from David's line would always be alive until the Messiah came. That was the promise of God. But King Ahaz forgot that. He forgot that. He was a direct descendant of David, but he was backslidden. He forgot the promise of God. And because he was backslidden, not only did he forget the promise of God, but he didn't believe the promise of God. And what happens when you don't believe God? It leads you to fear for your life, doesn't it? So simple. Always remember, your heart will either be filled with one of two things. You will either have faith or you will have fear. You won't have both. Either you're going to trust God or you're not. And that's the place that Ahaz and his people whom he led found himself in. They were fearing for their lives because they had no faith in God, because they forgot what the word of God had promised them. Now, what's amazing about this, and this is heavy duty, how many times have people had the idea that they can get away with sin? Does that cross our minds sometimes? I can do that. All I got to do is tell God I'm sorry, right? Even Christians. I mean, the world believes that there's no, there's no penalty, but Christians who should know still sometimes believe, convince themselves that somehow they're going to get away with their sin. They just got to come and tell God they're sorry. They just got to say a prayer after. They just got to come back to church. And it's a sad lie that so many people believe. Because the truth is, sin will always cost us something. Isn't that right? Nothing's free. God sees everything. Remember, God is not mocked. Now, what happens when a believer, a Christian, sins against God? Well, two things happen. Always remember this. Number one, your sin will now keep you from the blessings that God wanted to give you. Always remember that. And I've used this analogy before. I want you to imagine a clear plastic tube that was on your head. It was invisible, and it went all the way up to heaven. You guys picture that? And every time God wanted to bless you, he sent a blessing down the tube. We get that picture? Well, sin is like sludge. We know what sludge is, right? It's like grime. It's grimy. When you sin against God, grime is in that tube. And it keeps the blessings that God wants to give you. It's a good picture of sin. And so number one, when we sin against God, we rob ourselves of the blessing that God wanted to give us. But that's not all. The second thing that we lose when we choose to sin is we lose the peace of God. Isn't that right? We don't feel peace afterwards. How many times? Again, I'll raise my hand too. Have we chosen sin? Have we given into temptation? And we feel terrible afterwards. It happens to all of us. And it's a lesson, again, a lesson for all of us. It's always going to cost us something. It'll cost us the blessings of God, and it'll cost us the peace, the peace of God that God wants us to have. And so think about this. The next time you are tempted to sin, ask yourself this question, is it worth losing the blessings? 
Is it worth losing the peace that God wants you to have? It's not worth it. It never is worth it. Now, when we know better and we still sin, how many of you would agree that's even worse? Right? Seriously. How many of you, you being honest, would say that Ahaz, because he knew better and he still sinned against God, he deserved whatever he got? We would all say that. It's true. Why do I say Ahaz knew better? Well, remember, he had a godly grandfather and a godly father, didn't he? He knew better. And when he knew better, again, rebelling against God only made things worse, which is why you can explain why God allowed him to be so fearful, to literally fear for his life. He deserved this to happen to him. Now, God could have said, you know what, Ahaz, you rebelled against me, it's on you. And God could have done that, right? But how many of you think God is so good, right? Literally, he is so good that he didn't give up on Ahaz. He sends Isaiah. He sends Isaiah to speak to the king and to encourage him and to remind him of some things he needed to hear. Second thing tonight, the calming message the calming message that Isaiah brings. Verse three, the Lord said to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz, the king, you and Shear Jishub. I can't even say that, right? Shear Jishub, your son. This is Isaiah's son. At the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. In his mercy, again, the Lord sends the prophet Isaiah to meet the king. God knew exactly where the king would be. I love that. We see it here. God knew that with the enemy on their way, the king would be inspecting the water. Every kingdom relied on water for its people. And so they would build aqueducts and they would build conduits to make sure water was able to flow underground into the city. And so with Judah being under attack, the king was out there inspecting the water supply. And so God tells Isaiah, this is where he's going to be. You go and you deliver to the king this message. But he tells him, I want you to bring your son, and the name of his son, I'll try to say it again, Shear Jishub. Now that name means something. If you're taking notes, write down, it means a remnant shall return. That's what that name means. A remnant shall return. The reason God commanded Isaiah to bring his son because of what his son symbolically meant. When he told the king, this is my son, a remnant shall return, it was a sign to the king that although, again, the nation was backslidden, that although Ahaz was backslidden, one day a remnant shall return. God knew one day the people would return back to him, which is why Isaiah brings his son and delivers this message. Verse four, say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Ramalia. Because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Ramalia has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up, to, up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. God, speaking through Isaiah, tells the king, stop stressing, stop complaining, right? Stop worrying about your enemies. And I love it because so often when we find ourselves in a crisis, that's what we do, right? We murmur, we complain, we bicker, we stress, we worry again. It's the same thing that was happening. And I love the words. God tells them, be careful. And I love those words, be careful. Why? Because it means be careful what you're doing. Be careful how you're living. Be careful what you're 
planning. God knew it all. God knew what was in Ahaz's mind. Again, be, care, be quiet. Stop complaining. Do not fear. Stop worrying. Isaiah told them all of these things. God knew what was taking place. God was allowing this crisis to take place. King Ahaz had heard what their plan was. They were going to come. They were going to conquer Judah. They were going to kill King Ahaz and his family. Whenever they killed the king, they killed the whole family. And they were going to destroy, again, the land of Judah. Isaiah had heard that. The pe- I'm sorry, Ahaz had heard that. The people had heard that, and they were fearful. Now, what's so interesting, again, I was thinking about this. They came to steal the throne. They came to kill Ahaz and his descendants, and they came to destroy the kingdom of Judah. Does that sound like anybody? It was like our enemy who's out to steal, kill, and destroy. It's the same thing, again, that we face on a daily basis is what Ahaz was experiencing. And so, verse 7, thus says the Lord God, this is what God said, it shall not stand, it's not going to happen, it shall not come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, the head of Damascus is Rezin, and within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. God, through Isaiah, first tells King Ahaz, don't worry. Check yourself, but don't worry. Stop worrying, because it's not going to happen. And God declares it. Thus says the Lord, it is not going to happen. Syria is coming. Israel is coming, but they're not going to get through. They are not going to conquer you. And God wanted him to know that. He needed to be reminded. Why? Because as I said before, because he was backslidden, again, he forgot the promise of God. He forgot the promise that God made to his ancestor, King David, promising that family line would not go extinct. It wasn't going to happen. When God makes a promise, God keeps his promise. And if Ahaz would have only remembered that, if he would have only remembered what God said, he wouldn't have feared. He wouldn't have put himself through everything he put himself through. But again, these are the consequences that happen, especially for children of God who forget what God says who don't believe the promise that God has given us. And again, I love this because you can apply it to us as well. God does not want us to stress. He does not want us to worry. And I know there are so many things for us to worry about and stress about right now. I get that. But this is not what God wants. God wants wants us to trust him. He wants us to believe his word. He wants us to know again, that he's with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us, right? He wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. This is all that God desires from us. So many people, again, stress themselves out, and I'm specifically talking about Christians, giving in to fear when we're not supposed to because this is never what God desires. Remember, again, what Paul said in 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. It's not. It's not from God. Whenever we are fearing, stressing, worrying, that's not of God. That's from the enemy. And when we are doing that, we are believing the enemy instead of trusting in God. The same exact thing, again, that was taking place in the life of Ahaz. I'll go one step further. If you find yourself stressing, worrying, or fearing about anything, it's not God's fault. It's yours, because it's never what God wanted. If we believe in him, if we trust in him again, we won't have to worry, because we will remember again all the promises that he's given us in his word, and we will remember literally that God has the whole world in his hands. Amen? Let's move on. Number three, the confirming sign. The confirming sign. Verse 10, again, the Lord spoke to King Ahaz, 
Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, the grave, or high as heaven. Now, I love this. God knew Ahaz's heart. He knew he had no faith. He knew he wasn't believing God. And so God wanted to help him. I think this is awesome. Some of you might remember the story of Gideon in Judges chapter 6. Gideon was fearful. He was doubtful. He said, God, could you show me a sign to help me believe it? And God showed him a sign, actually several signs. Well, God does the same exact thing here. He's willing to help us. Even if we're struggling in our faith, God knows, God understands, and he's willing to help. And so God invites Ahaz, ask me to do something for you. I mean, this is rare in the Bible, but God does this. Ahaz, I want to help you. Ask me to show you a sign. You can come up with anything. Anything you can think of from the grave to the highest heavens. He literally gives Ahaz like a blank check. Just tell me to do something, and I'll do it to show you. That's what God asked. Notice, again, Isaiah even uses the words, look at verse 11, ask a sign of the Lord, your God. You see the your? Don't forget, Ahaz, I'm your God. You might be backslidden, but I'm still your God. I'm still here for you. God was reaching out to him. But look what happened, verse 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. And I will not put the Lord to the test. Now, God had just told him, just just say something. I'll show you. I'll help your unbelief. But instead, Ahaz says, no, I'm I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. Now, that sounds holy. It really does. And we know that because Ahaz was quoting Scripture. He quotes Deuteronomy 6.16, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so he He responds to God again, acting holy. Oh, it's okay, God. I'm not going to put you to the test. But what's sad about this is Ahaz did this not because he respected and believed God. He did this. He did not ask for a sign because he knew if he asked for a sign, God would give it to him. And then he would be obligated to believe God. And he didn't want to believe God. He didn't want to have anything to do with God. And so he said, no, I'm not going to do it. No, I'm not going to do it. How sad is that? Verse 13. And he, speaking of Isaiah, said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also. Isaiah understood what Ahaz was doing, that he was rejecting God. God was reaching out to him, and he was rejecting God because he wanted nothing to do with God. And Isaiah tells him, you know what, Ahaz? It's one thing when you try my patience, but to try God's patience, that's too much. You are trying the patience of my God. Lord, help us, right? Not to try the patience of our God. Verse 14, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Does that sound familiar to anybody? What a famous verse that we come up against. Now, let me explain this to you quickly. Ahaz refused to pick a sign. And so God says, it's okay, Ahaz. I'm going to pick a sign for you. And that's what God does. God now gives Ahaz a sign that would prove that everything he told him was going to happen. In other words, when this sign happens, you will know that everything else I say also will come to pass. And what Isaiah declares is that a virgin girl was going to have a son. Somehow Ahaz would know of this virgin girl. When she has a son, she's going to call him Emmanuel. 
And when that happens and Ahaz finds out about it, he's going to know that this was the Lord. He's going to know that this was the Lord. Now, we're going to talk more about this next week, okay? But we know when we read this today, who is this referring to? It's referring to Jesus, isn't it? Now, this is an awesome lesson. Why? Many of you know, and we've covered this many times, that oftentimes whenever God spoke through a prophet, there would be a near fulfillment, and then there would also be a future fulfillment. You guys with me? Why would this happen? Well, God would do something to prove his word was true back then, but it would also apply to his plan for the future. And the reason God would do this is not only for them, but for us as well. Because we can know that when God kept his word in the near fulfillment, he would also keep his word in the future fulfillment. And we know, again, this is exactly what took place. God spoke this. This came to pass during the life of Isaiah, but it also came to pass in the life of Jesus. We know this again, Matthew 1.22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Isaiah, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This was a prophecy given, again, I'll say it again, in the life of Isaiah. We're going to talk more about that next week. But it also had a future fulfillment when Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Verse 15, he shall eat curds, speaking of the baby, and honey, when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread, speaking of King Ahaz, will be deserted. In this prophecy, the Lord declares again that this child was going to be born, and before the kid is old enough to determine right from wrong, those two kings, the land they occupied would be deserted, okay? This is how Ahaz would know that God's word was true. Now, according to Hebrew and Jewish culture, a boy was considered a man at age 13, right? They call it the bar mitzvah. It means son of the law. In other words, he is responsible as a man under the law when he turns 13. And so according to this prophecy, before that kid turns 13, those two nations would be destroyed. You guys with me? This is the prophecy. And the amazing thing, again, is true to God's word, God spoke this in the year 734 BC. Three years later, the Assyrians destroyed Syria in 732 BC. And 10 years later, in the year 722 BC, the Assyrian army came in and destroyed the northern kingdom, just as the Lord said. Very, very important. Let's look at this last thing, and we're done for tonight. The coming invasion. The coming invasion. Verse 17. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim, Israel, departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. Now here's what's sad. Had King Ahaz believed God believed Isaiah, repented of his sin, and turned to God, God would have saved him. Remember, salvation is of the Lord. But he didn't do that. He rejected God. He rejected Isaiah. Because he didn't want to have anything to do with God. Because he, again, didn't want to have to trust in the Lord. So what did King Ahaz do to try and save himself from Israel and Syria. According to 2 Chronicles 28, 16, at that time, King Ahaz sent to the king of Assyria for help. 
He turns to the Assyrian Empire. And because he turned to the Assyrian Empire and rejected God, God told him, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to pay the penalty. You're going to be punished by guess who? God said it. Look back what he says. The king of Assyria. Verse 18. In that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they will all come and settle in the steep ravines and the clefts of the rocks and on all the thorn bushes and on all the pastures. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor that is higher beyond the river Euphrates with the king of Assyria, the head and the feet and, and the hair of the feet, and it will sweep away the beard also. And that day a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep, and because of the abundance of milk that they give, he will eat curds, and everyone who is left in the land will eat curds and honey. And that day every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. With bow and arrows a man will come there for all the land will be briars and thorns. And as for all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for fear of briars and thorns, for they will become a place where cattle are let loose and where the sheep tread. What happened here is instead of trusting God, in his foolishness, Ahaz turned to the Assyrians to help. Now the Assyrians did help. As I mentioned, they defeated Syria and they defeated Israel. But guess what? After they did that, they came for Judah as well. Like a dummy, I was thinking about this. Like a dummy, Ahaz was like a mouse who was running from two rats. You guys with me? And that mouse turns to the cat for help. And the cat eats them all. That's the picture. That's literally, again, what happened. And God declared, this is what is going to happen to you. And just like God said, last verse, 2 Chronicles 28, 20. So when the king, this is his name, Tiglath Pileser of Assyria arrived, he attacked Ahaz. Instead of helping him, Ahaz took valuable items from the Lord's temple, the royal palace, and from the homes of his officials and gave them to the king of Assyria as tribute, but this did not help him. God gave him a chance. God spared him. God gave him an opportunity to be saved. But sadly, some people have to learn the hard way. They can decide as we all get to decide. We can go to the Lord and God will be there. God will have mercy. God will save us. He is a good God. But if we choose not to, if we choose to save ourselves or if we choose to rely on someone else to save us, we can do that all we want, but we too will learn the hard way. Amen?